Welcome to Trending in Education. Mike Palmer here. Really happy today to be joined by Jeremy C. Young, who's the program director for Freedom to Learn at PEN America. I had Jonathan Friedman from PEN America on a while back. Shout out to Jonathan, shout out to PEN America, and welcome to you, Jeremy. Welcome to Trending in Education. Well, thank you. I'm real pleased to be here. Your title, which is new, and congratulations, includes the words freedom to learn. We're going to be talking about academic freedom and some of the trends we've been seeing, particularly around higher ed. By now, my listeners know that I am a New College alum who is struggling with the gradual and speedy destruction of a lot of what I loved about New College back in the day. Fortunately, PEN America and others are there to help with that conversation. We'll get into that in a bit. Before we get into that, I'd love to hear from you in your own words, your origin story, how you got to this point in your professional life. Well, I have to say, it's, it's certainly not something that you could ever plan that I would end up in this spot. I mean, I was a history professor. That's what it com comes down to. I trained as a history professor, got a PhD, you know, got eventually, after much searching and many years, a tenure-track job in rural Utah, Utah Tech University, where I was assistant professor of U.S. history and also the director of the Institute of Politics and Public Affairs on that campus. And, you know, I thought I was going to do that for the rest of my life. And at some point I decided, you know, that I wanted to do something that was a little more in the fray. Uh, I wanted to get a little more involved in, you know, what was happening in our country, what was happening in society. You know, being a professor is very rewarding in a lot of ways, but you are definitely changing the world, you know, 40 students at a time. And I wanted to change the world one system at a time. And so I made the jump actually to nonprofit work at the American Historical Association, where I worked on the operations side. I was the communications and marketing manager and in charge of membership recruitment and retention. Did that for two years. And as part of that work, a small part of that work, you know, when these, what we at the AHA would have called divisive concepts bills, anti-critical race theory bills, began to be proposed you know, we had a very small funded project, which was also called Freedom to Learn, as it happens. And I was put in charge of that project. It was a very small part of my load. And in that work, we partnered very closely with PEN America. And eventually, PEN America was able to open up a full-time position doing that work. And so I made the jump. And here I am. We've got a team of three now. Might be adding more in the near future. But it's just a really growing and really important area of work responding to these educational censorship laws and proposals and you know, really threats to academic freedom in higher ed, to education in the K-12 space. Yeah. And I know there's some interesting distinctions between where the focus is for PEN America in K-12 versus higher ed. We'll get into that a little bit in a bit. But also, folks may not be familiar with PEN America, its mission, and its history. Can you catch us up quickly on that side of the equation? Absolutely. PEN America is a 100-year-old organization celebrating our 100th anniversary this year. It's a membership association of writers. We understand the intersection of free speech and human rights. We celebrate writers and the work that they do and readers, and we promote and protect both their right to write and to read and the right of free expression more generally. We do work in a variety of areas. We work on international cases, protecting writers who are being jailed or persecuted for their work. We talk about digital safety. We talk about you know, tech policy, that's within our purview as well. And of course, education. Mm -hmm. And then on the education side, there's two main pillars right now in the focus, as I understand it. One is what you're focused on, which is the freedom to learn and resisting the censorious action that is happening within education across the board, particularly in higher education, to really suppress some types of academic expression. And that's what really connects to what's happening at New College, which we'll get into in a bit. The other side is more looking at recent trends. And this is part of what Jonathan was talking to me about when he was on a little while back around book bans in K-12. I know that's not your area of focus, but can you at least describe some of the activity that Penn's been looking at? And then we can dig deeper into your area of focus. Absolutely. So our work on book bans, and we are, you know, we are tracking and analyzing the bans that we're seeing around the country since a year and a half ago, since the beginning of the 2021-2022 school year, we've tracked over 4,000 
book bans in 37 states around the country. You know, just an epidemic of book banning that we haven't seen in decades. And our goal is to, you know, raise the awareness of this real threat to free expression in American classrooms, in American schools. These books are being banned primarily from school libraries, although there have been some public library bans as well. And also to, you know, support the writers who are being banned, who many of whom are pen members, you know, and just make sure that their work is accessible and try to turn back this wave of book banning, which really is devastating for American school children and for our society at large. Yeah. So that covers a lot of what's happening in K-12. But then on the other side, in terms of academic freedom, freedom of speech, protecting writers' ability to not be chilled by the cultural climate and not be suppressed in terms of the ideas that they want to grapple with. I'd love to hear a little more about how you're thinking about freedom to learn. And then from there, I think we can dig a little more deeply into how New College has become really the front lines of a lot of what's going on these days. Absolutely. So the Freedom to Learn program was born as a response to a wave, a really unprecedented wave of what we call educational gag orders, basically divisive concepts or anti-critical race theory bills that are designed to ban or restrict content in college and K-12 through classrooms. And in fact, almost all of them apply to K-12 through classrooms. We've charted over 300 of these bills being proposed since mm -hmm. 2021. 23 of them have become law in 16 states. Two other states have policies on the books that enforce these restrictions. And eight states have restrictions specifically in higher education. And to put this in perspective, we're talking about one third of the country is affected by some sort of law that restricts what teachers in K-12 or higher education can say to students, what they can assign students, how they can talk about our past about our great works of literature, about the world in which students find themselves. Hmm. And, you know, so we, we've, we do a lot of things in this program. You know, we write reports. We have two reports that have come out about educational gag orders in the last two years. We do a legislative tracking and analysis. We have a legislative tracker that is updated every week. We also do a lot of publicity work, like I'm talking to you, media work, and also a lot of organizing efforts, trying to get higher education associations in particular to form a coalition capable of responding effectively to this legislation. You know, we, I do mm -hmm. a lot of presentations to groups like that. You know, we have organizing meetings. Probably the most exciting thing we've done recently, uh, we've created a new initiative within the Freedom to Learn program, the Champions of Higher Education, which is an initiative of over 200 former college and university presidents and system heads who have come together and signed a statement indicating their willingness to respond in their local communities to these attacks on free expression in the classroom. They represent 47 states and the District of Columbia, so almost the entire country. You know, we have presidents, former presidents from Harvard, from Princeton, from Columbia, all the way down to community colleges. And the last thing I would say on this, you know, you know Mike, is that we are, we are seeing a shift in the tactics that we're responding to, there are still anti-critical race theory bills being proposed and passed. But increasingly, there are bills that go far beyond restricting what is it taught in the classroom to restrict the basic governance structure of colleges and universities. Bills that rewrite the curriculum, bills that rewrite general education, that rewrite even the mission statement of the college, yeah. and that put control over those things in the hands of politicians and political appointees. It's a really terrifying and alarming new trend, and that's really what we're responding to today. Yeah, it makes sense. Shout out to New College, former president, Pat Oker, who was recently on the show, Dr. Oker did sign on to PEN America's Champions of Higher Education, as did Esther Barazone, who is an alum of New College's charter class. That does bring us to New College. New College is really where you and I connected in that I'm an alum. And I noticed that PEN America was active in the space, which was inspiring to me and gave me a little bit of hope that there was some support from organizations like PEN America out there. But how did New College get onto PEN America's radar and how would you characterize what's going on down there? So how did New College get on our radar? I mean, we saw the moment that the governor appointed Chris Rufo and all of these other national political operatives to the board, New College, the Board of Trustees at New College. We were aware of it. We were deeply concerned by it. New College is, in some ways, is very personal for me, even though I didn't attend New College. I attended 
a very similar school, St. Mary's College of Maryland, a public liberal arts college, just like New College. I was aware of New College when I was applying to school. So when I saw that this had happened there, I knew immediately what this was and what it would do. And very shortly after that, we received an outpouring of communications asking for help from faculty, from students, from alumni, you know, just really asking us to give them some guidance to support and amplify their efforts. I eventually went to New College and gave a keynote address for a faculty teach-in about the issue. And since then, you know, we have just observed just the most appalling behavior on the part of the trustees and, you know, the new administration in firing President Oker, firing other senior staff members, including a library dean, you know, director of DEI, you know, easing the provost out the door, just drive-by firings of senior administrators and not so senior administrators. And then the denial of these tenure cases, faculty members going up for tenure, denied, basically, you know, not told a very good reason why. It, it, there's not a lot of communication going on. There is an incredible chilling effect going on. And mm. really what we are seeing at New College is, you know, New College is the Petri dish. It is the demonstration garden for what is planned throughout the country. If the people promoting this, you know, take power in other states, if they take power federally, this is what they're talking about doing. So it's very important. I mean, it's important for New College for sure, but it's also important on a national level. It's very important. You know, we think about New College, we work on New College every day at 10 America in our national office, because this is a school that is, you know, the, the fate of this school is going to determine the fate of higher education in this country to an astonishing degree. Yeah, I've called it the canary in the swamp, like a coal mine, but the swamp in terms of some of the corruption and the cronyism that we're starting to see there. And then sadly, the canary, as I understand it, may not live to sing, at least in Sarasota, anytime soon. We'll see. But you're touching on why it's important to fight the fight. This is a place where if you concede too much turf early, it's very difficult to reclaim that. And Florida under DeSantis and now President Corcoran and Chris Rufo is on the board of trustees down at New College. It is in some ways the forefront of tactics that are clearly authoritarian. There's a playbook in Hungary that Chris Rufo was ramping up on while he was remoting in to a recent board of trustees meeting. Talk about Big Brother. There's the mastermind of the backlash against CRT is looming over the board of trustees meeting. New College is important. Can you describe why it's important? You touched on it a little bit, but why it's important to fight and then how Pan America and folks who are digging in a bit, how you're thinking about affecting some positive change down there. The independence of public higher education and private higher education from direct political control is the only way that free expression and intellectual freedom can exist on a college campus. And it's important to understand that in our increasingly polarized society, there are fewer and fewer places where people from different backgrounds with different ideas can get together and talk in an open and honest and structured way about the issues facing our society. And colleges and universities are one of the last bastions of that kind of free expression. Mm -hmm. And what we are seeing at New College, what we are seeing throughout the country to some degree with these laws, is a systematic effort to destroy the public sphere at colleges, to make it so that students and teachers do not feel they can speak openly about these topics, and therefore so that students who attend these schools will not learn about the world around them, will not learn about people who are different from them, people who are the same as them, and will go on to become voters and leaders in our democracy without having the tools they need to be effective democratic citizens. So it really is a threat to the heart of our democracy, what we're seeing. And New College, as I mentioned, is particularly important because it is the place where the forces that are trying to suppress free expression in public education through government control are evaluating and testing their strategies. The place where they are you know, trying to determine, can this be done at a college? It's a place where they have all the advantages, frankly. It's a small college. It's not financially wealthy. It doesn't have a lot of benefactors who are out there fighting back against it. An overwhelming force is being brought to bear, you know, by the trustees, by the legislature, by the governor. You know, it's a very tough fight. And I think it's a very necessary fight. 
Because what we want to demonstrate, we want to do a few things at New College. First, and most important, we want to support the students, we want to support the faculty, we want to support the community who are deeply wedded to this college. We are not going to do anything, and nor should anyone else do anything, that is going to damage the school any more than it's already been damaged by the reckless and destructive actions of the trustees. And to be um, clear... Just since yes. January 6th, like we're not talking about a long span of time and every board of trustees meeting winds up being like reality television. The most recent one that I was watching, Matt Lipinski, the academic rep on the board of trustees, quit at the end of the session after five faculty members who were basically approved tenure prior to that meeting were then denied tenure. It's a fast moving situation, each one of these meetings, it does seem like they're trying to push more things through. So, you know, as you're setting that context, we're not talking about a long history. This is a rapidly moving over the last four or five months, we've seen all of this activity. That's absolutely right. And, you know, the damage the trustees are doing to this institution is incalculable. There are issues with admissions. There are issues with donors. You know, there are issues with accreditation. Mm -hmm. And I want to be clear, we do not celebrate these things. This college has become a symbol, but it is also a real place with real people who have livelihoods, who are students trying to learn about the world and make their way in the world. You know, this is an institution that must be preserved. And, you know, we are not going to play the game of destroying the village in order to save it. That's what they're doing to New College, not what we would seek to do. So we want to support the people who are there. We want to support the efforts of what's going on there. And we also want to make sure that whatever ground that the trustees are able to take over the history of this special college is done as slowly and politically costly as possible. We want to send a message that, you know, coming in and taking over college, destroying the things that make it beautiful, you know, attacking the students and faculty and staff is not it's censorship and it's not without a political cost. And if legislators in other states, if trustees in other states are looking at this, what they need to see is this does not end well for you. This mm. does not end well for the censors. This is not something that is popular. The governor is popular, but the takeover of the college is not popular. And mm -hmm. it will get increasingly unpopular as it continues. It will look worse and worse with every news story that comes out. You know, this is a very sympathetic college. People like David and Goliath stories. The trustees, they ain't David. This is a message and a warning to other states not to do this to a college. And that it is vitally important and that the community will support the protection of academic freedom at universities. Yeah. And to be clear around what PEN America stands for, you will also protect academic freedom for speech that you may not be a big supporter of. Like You are protecting writers' freedom of expression, even when some of those things may disagree with, let's say, left-leaning progressive ideology, which is one of the main critiques here, is that you know New College was indoctrinating the youth in a politicized intellectual agenda. Pen America, in some ways, is dispassionate and is supporting the healthy discourse that in, in many ways is missing from our civic life these days. That's absolutely right. And, you know, we have been concerned in the past and are still concerned that there is a climate of censoriousness on college campuses that emanates from the left. We have devoted a lot of our work and a lot of our programming to try to increase viewpoint diversity on campus, to try to in instill and inculcate the values of free expression through campus programming and trainings and through our work. That is our goal. If your interest here is in creating a more varied campus with less group think, you know, we are on your team. Sign us up. We will come and help. And we are also eager to promote and support the speech rights of figures who, with whom we vehemently disagree. As just an example from this week, John Saylor from the National Association of Scholars, who has been one of the leading figures advocating for these laws that I, I, we're talking about, was supposed to speak on a medical campus in Wisconsin, and this, the lecture was canceled. We put out a statement defending him. You know, it is precisely when you disagree the most with someone that it is the most important to protect robustly their right to say what they think. And I'll tell you why. 
I want to have an opportunity to argue with these folks. You know, I think they're wrong, and I think that my ideas will prevail in the marketplace of ideas if we are able to have a fair and open discussion about them. If we don't have that discussion, those bad ideas that I disagree with, they just gain purchase. You know, it, it makes them stronger. It does not weaken an idea to give it a platform. So, yes, we are absolutely here to protect free expression on every side, including with people with whom we vehemently disagree. But you do not protect free expression by censoring one side. And mm -hmm. that is what these laws do. That is what the trustees are trying to do. You know, you come into a college and you say, there's too many liberals on this campus, so we're going to fire them. We're going to censor them, and then we'll have more viewpoint diversity. That's not the way you do it. All that leads to is everyone on the campus being terrified to say what they think about anything. And then yeah. you don't have open inquiry. You have authoritarian control. The website is pen.org. For those of you who are interested, we'll include links in the show notes. They do have trainings for educators and for others in terms of how to encourage civil discourse and actually how to engage in free speech and engage with difference, you know, counter some of the risky shifts of groupthink that you were touching on there. Shout out to Irving Janis. From your perspective, what are some scenarios in terms of how this might play forward? I've Talk to enough futurists on this podcast that they frequently recommend thinking about multiple futures, painting pictures that are both good, bad, and weird, good, bad, and surprising. Any thoughts on how this might play forward? And this is the more speculative fiction side of the conversation, but there's obviously a little bit of prognosticating that's built into any trend spotting show. Any thoughts on how this might play forward and how folks can help steer towards outcomes that we're hoping for? Well, I'll tell you this. History tells us and the current moment tells us that waves of censorship do not break until the general public turns against them. There must be consequences for what is happening at New College, for what is happening nationwide with colleges and universities. We must turn in our civic life, in our views, in our values. We must recognize that attacks on teachers, attacks on higher education institutions are attacks on American democracy. And if we begin to embrace that as a country, and I think there are already encouraging signs that this is happening, that this is becoming a more salient issue for many people, it is the most popular position that you know, the, the large majority of, of Americans think that the government should not tell teachers what they should be teaching mm -hmm. in the classroom. But it needs to become more than just a view. It needs to become something that people feel in their bones and feel is urgent. Mm -hmm. And once that happens, we will see this tide recede. But until that happens, they're just going to keep doing what they're doing. If you're a listener and you want to know what can you do, tell everyone you know what is happening at New College. Tell everyone you know what is happening with educational gag order bills. Tell your family, tell your friends, write letters to the editor, write op-eds in your local paper. Any opportunity you have to raise the alarm about what is happening, that's what we need right now. The other thing I heard, although it may apply a little more to the K-12 side of the equation, is to run for your local school board. You know, this happens to be an off-cycle national election, but a lot of local elections are happening this year. So if you did want to get activated, you could either figure out who is running, who you support, and or throw your own hat in the ring. And then this is likely to continue to be a hot topic through the presidential election next year, where education has been elevated in its prominence politically based on some of the successes that we've seen in places like Florida and Virginia, it's likely that some folks will be triangulating to land in the right lane. Arguably, DeSantis is overreaching, and just like he's not doing well with Disney, this may be another political loser going after New College, fingers crossed. But as we head into a political cycle that will lead into 2024, Thoughts on where this may head, thoughts on the role that free speech and the work that PEN America is going to do heading into 2024? Well, we're probably going to keep doing what we're doing. We, you know, we are a nonpartisan organization. We don't take stands in elections, period. We don't care who wins any particular election. What we care is what they do after they've won, right? We want to see a society where the value of public education, where the value of free expression is upheld as a paramount value and a source of pride, really, in, in America. We should be proud of our public institutions. They are the envy of the world, our higher education institutions. 
so our goal, you know, we're just going to keep spreading the word. We're going to keep talking about the, these bills and these efforts in New College and just let people know, you know, how important this is. And hopefully, you know, my hope, let me tell you what my real hope is. My hope is that I get pushed out of a job because there's nothing to do. Because there aren't people anymore who are arguing that we should be censoring public education, censoring higher education, shutting down colleges and curricula. You know, the goal isn't to win so much as it is to change enough hearts and minds that this ceases to be an issue. And if that happens, then, you know, good for us. I'll find something else to do. Great stuff here with Jeremy C. Young, the Program Director for Freedom to Learn at PEN America. For those who've enjoyed this conversation, be on the lookout for a dedicated new college feed that will allow us to go deep into the conversation over there. As we're wrapping up here, Jeremy, any concluding thoughts, any takeaways for our listeners as they head back to the rest of their lives? Yes. I don't like to end on a, a sad note. I don't want to end on a hopeless note because I don't think it's hopeless. And I'll say this, these are unprecedented attacks on public higher education. And what that means, the silver lining here, is there is an unprecedented opportunity for solidarity in response, right? We are seeing groups and figures and leaders in higher education coming together in a way I would never have thought possible two years ago or five years ago to fight this stuff. 200 retired college presidents coming forward and saying, enough, we're not going to do this anymore. We're not going to go after public education. Public education matters. And what I think we're going to see is the growth of a movement to defend higher education to promote it as a good in American society that will outlast this movement to censor it, to shut it down, and that will become a key pillar of support for this sector and for the value of our higher educational institutions for a long time to come. To quote Dirty Dancing, nobody puts baby in a corner. Be on the lookout for the response to some of the overreach that we've seen at my alma mater, New College. Jeremy, thank you so much for joining me on today's show. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. And for our listeners, hopefully you enjoyed what you heard. If you did, please write us a review, subscribe, do all the good things, be on the lookout for that New College feed. We'll be back again soon. This is Trending in Education. <laughs> <laughs>